Some of the first words you learn when studying different language are the expression used to say when you've done something wrong, like, I'm sorry, forgive me, pardon me, um, or as they say these days, my bad. Uh, native speakers in any language have grown up learning these words about how to ask for forgiveness. When we were little, didn't all our mothers teach us how to tell us when we heard our brother and sister to say, say you're sorry now, say you're sorry. And, and all languages have, have words for that. Many of them have to do with stating our own feelings of regret and sorrow. I'm sorry that I hurt you. I feel bad for what I've done. I regret that I hurt you. Other phrases are used to request forgiveness from the other person, acknowledging that we are in debt to the other person from our offense. Pardon me, forgive me, excuse me. All these words describe the communication that takes place between two people when there's an argument, an injury, or even a simple mistake. Everyday language is meant to have civil con conventions that express similar dynamics in all our interpersonal relationships to kind of smooth out the bumpy roads uh, uh, that we have. Uh, here's how it went in my family. My father used to discipline some of his, all of his five sons at home. Most of the tom time it was mom who did the main disciplining but every once in a while it was, wait till your father gets home. Then you knew you, would, you were in trouble. Imagine how many fights and arguments there would be with five brothers, all of us between 20 and 22 months uh, apart, very close in age. There'd be a fight, someone would get hurt. Dad would come home from work and my mother would tell him what happened. Then he'd investigate a little bit and then decide who was at fault, most of the time with everybody sharing the blame. He would say, tell your brother you're sorry. And then we'd grudgingly say in that quiet voice, sorry. And then he'd say, what? I didn't hear you. Louder. And so we'd say a little more forcefully, I'm sorry. And then he would say, say it, speak it like you mean it. You really mean it. And then we'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Then my dad would say something that I don't think I've heard too often. Um, it doesn't seem to be emphasized as much, but it's at the heart of the gospel today. He would then turn to the person who would in be injured, who was the one injured in the party, and say, now even brother, pagan brothers say sorry, but it's the Christian who says, I forgive you. Now it's your turn to tell your brother that you forgive him. I don't know what was easier, saying I'm sorry or saying forgive me. But I tend to think it's, it's more difficult to say I forgive you than to say I am sorry. My father was a good man. He was honest, dependable, hardworking, very faithful in his, to his family, his church, and his work, and his community. He'd come home every night from work to sit down and eat with his family at the dinner table. On weekends, he'd coach our baseball and soccer teams. He'd take us fishing, and he took us to Mass every Sunday where he might read the readings or assist the priest in distributing communion. He'd watch football with us on Sunday afternoons. Every once in a while he'd take us to the Cardinals, uh, St. Louis, to watch the Cardinals play baseball at the old Bush Stadium. He was a good man and I'm grateful for his example, but I am most grateful and thankful for teaching me what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a Catholic and his own great example of that. Today's gospel passage from Matthew 18 
demonstrates the difference between being civil and polite and saying you're sorry and requesting and forgiving forgiveness, something that's just the right thing to do in all societies. And then the Christian understanding of mercy and forgiveness and how far our forgiveness is supposed to go. Peter tries to minimize it. Give me a number. How many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? Seven? Seven? That's a holy number. That seems like about right. Surely after seven times we don't have to forgive them. Then Jesus says, no, 77 times. We must forgive. Jesus says we must forgive others so much and so often that we'll probably lose count of how many times we've had to forgive someone. Jesus goes on to illustrate this with a parable, a, a very important and striking, dramatic parable uh, to show you how important it is. A parable is a good story using the drama of everyday life to illustrate the gospel. A parable sounds just like every other story until a point where something happens that should surprise us. It should shock us. It, it tells us something that we, we normally don't accept, don't believe, or find hard to imagine. Or even it's just totally wrong. And in the parable today, the unbelievable twist to the story is this. A servant, slave, some type of servant or slave, owed his master an enormous debt, a huge debt. I think the, the Greek is 10,000 talents. That's about $100 million in, in some, some commentaries say. It's, it's quite extraordinary, enough that amount that this servant has no way of ever paying it back. The, the king forgave the servant a debt, that debt worth a huge amount. So that money is imaginable for us, and therefore the act of forgiveness is just as unbelievable. Why would this king forgive a debt? And not just forgive, I'll give you more time to pay it off, but no, you don't owe this to me. Go on your way and, and be relieved of your debt. And this is where the Christian difference is found. The king's mercy can't be understood according to normal human logic and commerce. It can only be accepted. Yet the servant does not in turn show mercy to his fellow slave. And that's another twist. One would expect that the mercy that he received would flow then on down to his fellow servants who are in the likewise all indebted to their master. He throws him into prison. Pay back everything you owe, even to the point of choking him. The unmerciful servant should have been grateful for the forgiveness given him and therefore should have, been for, should have forgiven the debt of his fellow servant. Now let's be careful about having finished reading the story. We can be sidetracked by our righteous indignation about the wicked servant who was so unmerciful. That's understandable reaction. But we still have to take to heart the heart of the gospel the surprise twist to the part of this parable, the unfathomable mercy of the king. And that's how we stand in this church today. We come to God owing God everything, an unimaginable debt. And that is just the debt that comes from giving us life and all that goes with life. Now add to that the innumerable and and unrememberable number of sins that we have committed against God and our neighbor. What's done is done. There's nothing we can do to pay back to God and others 
for all the harm that we have done. And yet, God still forgives us. He looks upon us as a loving father and says, I forgive you. You don't owe me anything. That's the fundamental experience of the Christian, to come before God and experience his overwhelming mercy. The human heart suffers. The human heart remembers. We hold on to our injuries and hurts, and we don't want to forgive those who have harmed us. Today's parable teaches us how to get beyond our hurts, our pain, our reluctance to show mercy. We begin by going to God and confessing our sins, by bringing our debts before the Most High and say, my Lord, my debt is great beyond repay. And you know what the Lord will say to you? I forgive you. I know you can never pay back the debt you owe for your sin. That's why my son, Jesus, became incarnate. So he could join with you so that he could take the burden that you carry, the burden of sin, and carry it upon his shoulders upon the hill of Calvary. All your sins are forgiven. This is the heart of the mystery of the incarnation and the passion of Jesus Christ. Now it is our time to, in turn, go and be merciful. <laughs>